Welcome to all the gardeners out there following us on Zoom, Facebook Live, and YouTube. Uh, my name is Sandra Shave, and I am the chair of the community classes for the North Fulton Master Gardeners. Um, we welcome you to the first class of the 2021 Spring Lecture Series, which is uh, a presentation on spring vegetable gardening by George Sessing. <clears throat> Um, this course is most appropriate for growing conditions in the Fulton County, Georgia area. Uh, if you, uh, which is planting zone number seven, if you are from outside of that area, please consult with your county extension office for instructions, which may be more precise for your region. The, for, the North Fulton Master Gardeners is an all volunteer organization whose purpose is to educate its members and the public in areas of horticulture and ecology. Um, we assist uh, the UG Extension uh, County by providing uh, free classes um, and uh, gardening education through the demonstration gardens and horticulture scholarships and children's gardening classes. Uh, this presentation is the first in a series of lectures and demonstrations. We have 10 classes lined up for you over the course of the next few months. And for more information on these classes and to register, please visit nfmg.net and click on the link for community classes. Um, you must register for each class separately if you wish to attend. You can also sign up for our email notifications on our website. Also, please follow us on social media. We're on all of the usual platforms. Just search for North Fulton Master Gardeners. Um, and we will show you this page again at the end of the presentation. Now, before we get started, uh, we've muted the audience to re reduce the background noise, but we welcome your questions. Um, just uh, to ask a question, go to the bottom of the Zoom page and type your, click on the Q&A button and type your question in the box. We'll pause about halfway through the presentation to answer some of the questions, and then we'll answer the rest of them at the end of the presentation. Um, and when you log off tonight, if you'd, um, you'll be directed to a short survey. We'd really uh, appreciate if you would let us know how you like the class and any suggestions you have for future courses. And now without any further ado, please welcome George Sesney, Master Garden of North Fulton. Well, happy Groundhog Day, everybody. <clears throat> if you've gotten six more weeks of winter, you're probably watching this course in uh, anticipation that you'll get the weather you want. If you haven't, uh, then this is very germane for right now because you're obviously going to be getting into your garden very soon. Um, I started gardening when I was very young. <clears throat> My father was a victory gardener in World War II. He planted five acres to support the war effort. And we continued that after the war. And when I was a kid, my punishment, if I did something bad, was to weed a 50 foot row of carrots that were two inches high and you can't pull out the carrots or the weeds. If you did it wrong, you got another row. So you learned to weed very well. But <clears throat> as, um, as I developed and uh, you know, got into my high school years and stuff, gardening became a way to make money. Uh, and as I retired, it became just a hobby that I really enjoy. I specialize in um, gardening vegetables because I like to support local food banks uh, who always need fresh vegetables mm -hmm. and as part of my outreach for the community. Today, we're going to talk about uh, spring vegetable gardening. You will see that we're going to have quite an agenda here. Um, but I want to say one thing. If you are in Georgia and you're new to the area, one thing that is really wonderful about North Georgia is you can garden 12 months a year here. Uh, I came from New York and you didn't start even considering gardening until the end of April uh, because the ground was just frozen and everything was way too cold. But having a 12 month gardening season here, if you love fresh vegetables, it's incredible. You can grow your vegetables year round. Uh, you know, in New York right now, they've got two feet of snow and down here we're watching the daffodils come up out of the ground and they're three inches higher. It is a wonderful area and the glory about gardening in the winter is that there are no bugs, it's not hot. Uh, and all of the green stuff that you pay so much money for in the stores 
thrives down here. And we'll talk about that a little, long, a little later. All of that cool weather um, is wonderful for green leafy vegetables and you can have some incredible yields in your garden throughout the winter and, and even right now when you start planting. You can see from the agenda, we've got a few things to cover. I'm not gonna go through that slide, but we're gonna to try to be fairly complete with what we do here tonight. And if you have any questions, by all means, type them in at the end. Okay, <clears throat> sustainable gardening is kind of the byword or the, the, the um, theory behind what we do as master gardeners. We want to not have a garden that is not going to be productive in many ways. Besides vegetables, we want to improve soil. We want to attract wildlife and have that wildlife be better for the fact that we have our gardens. Um, we're going to use natural methods so we can um, offset the bugs and the pests that we attract by bringing in their predators. And we'll talk about that more. Um, but it all starts with good soil. And in Georgia, if you ever go by a construction site, you see that nice red Georgia red clay and it's hard as a brick in the summer and it turns into wonderful gooey mud in the winter. It's wonderful stuff because it has great minerals and all kinds of nutrients in it, but in its current form as a, as a solid lump of clay, it's very bad for growing things because it doesn't have the air in it. It doesn't hold water well, it doesn't release water well. So when you garden, the very first thing is to work on your soil. If you have good soil, everything else is much easier to do. Your plants stay healthier. They are stronger. They ward off pests uh, much easier. So you don't have pest problems that you have to spray for or take care of. You get much better yields out of good soil. And that good soil, as I mentioned, gives you healthy plants. Okay. You can see here a, a, a list of sustainable garden versus conventional. Soil fertility is probably the key for healthy gardening and good yields of, in a garden in the south. Fertility comes from a lot of organic matter in your soil. And we have good news and bad news. Down here, we can garden 12 months a year. That's the good news. Down here, we can garden 12 months a year. That's the bad news. The reason it's bad news is that the microbes that eat all, all of the organic matter in your soil and release all of the minerals that the plants need, need to be fed 12 months a year. If you don't take care to add organic matter to your soil, uh, fertilizer and other things, the soil fertility dissipates. And what happens is it goes back to just being red old to red Georgia clay, which is not very good. So we, we work real hard on soil fertility. We'll talk about that. We do a lot of preventive pest control uh, as opposed to just spraying insecticides everywhere. Uh, if you have to use pesticides, we do it with biological pesticides or natural predators. Uh, takes a little bit more planting, uh, planning rather, before you plant. Um, you expect some loss. My dad used to call it nature share because he never used uh, chemicals in our garden. You reduce the tillage because your soil stays very loose, very crumbly, because you're adding organic matter to it all the time. It's a lot less expensive because you are using natural elements that you probably have can get for free. Uh, and it's a lot more satisfying, at least to me, because you go out in your garden on a regular basis and you monitor it. You know, for myself, I take my cocktail out at sundown and I walk around my garden and I look at leaves and see if I have pests and things. It's, it's the way I relax and it's the way I keep my garden healthy. So what you will see is that when we start from scratch, <clears throat> the first thing you need to do is get a good location. And you can see the difference between these two photographs. Top one has a lot of trees, which means a lot of root competition. It has a lot of shade, which means you're not going to get enough sunlight. The bottom one, there's no large trees around it. It's a bright sun. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. You're going to need eight to 10 hours of full sun to get a good yield in a vegetable garden. If you're only doing things like lettuce and cabbage and leafy vegetables, you might get away with six. 
But if you want tomatoes and peppers and okra and some of the other ones that really need a lot of sun, uh, eight is minimum, 10 is a lot, much, a lot better. You want to garden close to your house, close to water sources. Uh, you don't want to lug water in a, in a uh, pan. You don't want to run hoses. You want to be able to get out there easy to look at it, monitor it. It needs to drain very well. Um, if you have problems with drainage, if the only spot you have sun is a low spot, we'll talk about building raised beds in a bit. Um, definitely, if you have deer or hamsters, squirrels or rabbits, you have to fence. And fencing is a necessity. Otherwise, all you're doing is feeding God's creatures. I refuse to plant tomatoes anymore because I can't fence them well enough to keep the squirrels off of them. And the squirrels take the best tomato I have, and they take one little tiny bite out of it and they leave it there. And it's kind of like they're laughing at it. So I don't plant tomatoes. But if you set up your garden well, it becomes much easier to maintain it and you'll get a lot more benefit out of it. Okay, soil preparation. <clears throat> If you're going to do nothing the first summer or the first spring that you are going to do your garden, spend the time preparing soil. If you have that big lump of Georgia red clay that bakes so hard in the summer that you can't drive a shovel into it, you're not going to get good soil. You're not going to get good, good vegetables out of that soil. So you want soil that is loose, which is called friable. It crumbles easily, like in the picture. You want it to be deep, at least eight inches, uh, more than that if you can. Uh, you want to have a lot of organic matter into it, you know, have compost or uh, things like um, black cow manure, uh, peat moss, vermiculite, things that will break up that soil and keep it loose. Because what you want to do is you want to create air spaces. Perfect soil should be about 25% air, 25% water that is filling up part of that airspace, 50% the Georgia red clay and four or 5% of organic matter. That adds up to more than 100%, but you get the picture. So you need to add a lot of organic matter and you need to keep adding it every single year because as I mentioned earlier, the microbes eat it and then you, you tread back to how they get soil. If you have it, builder sand is a very good addition to your garden. The unfortunate part is it's very heavy, it's very expensive, and there's a lot of work in doing it. If you don't have it, that's okay. The whole idea is to get that soil loose, have a lot of air, have a lot of places roots can grow into it. It'll hold a lot of water and it has enough organic matter in it that it will support your plants. The key to the organic matter is the microbes we eat that produce acids and those acids dissolve all the little bits of stone that are in your uh, soil and that creates all the minerals that your plants take up and by having all that you have very healthy plants a lot of it has to do with ph you have to make sure you get your soil tested you want to have the, the ph balance which is the acidity of that soil in the range of six to six and a half because that allows the plants to absorb the most nutrients that they can. Below that, they stop absorbing. Above that, they stop absorbing. And some places where you have a lot of acidic soil, the plants just will not grow, period. And if you have to adjust your soil, <clears throat> powdered limestone is a great way to adjust the acidity of it. Uh, more likely than not, you'll probably have to, you'll have to add limestone there. Occasionally, your soils are too basic and then you might have to add sulfur. But if you get your soil tested, and we'll talk about that a little later, the Cooperative Extension Service will tell you exactly what you need to do to your soil to make it good for what you want to plant or what you want to grow. As I mentioned earlier, if you have bad drainage, you want to consider raised beds. Uh, water, a lot of water in the soil basically drowns your plants. Plants breathe a lot through their roots, and if all they have is water, they can't breathe. It's kind of like me holding your head underwater, you can't breathe, and they die. They don't, they don't thrive, and they ultimately will die. So you have to have good drainage. Here are examples of raised beds. Uh, you can see that the one at the uh, lower right 
All that is, is some improved soil that's been mounded up. There's nothing wrong with that. The one on the lower left has uh, one or two layers of siding that has raised a bit up. So it is uh, got a nice sharp edge to it. The one on the upper right probably is a little bit taller. And the one on the upper left obviously is extremely tall. What I, what I do is I build my beds up 16 inches, which is the height of the chair you're sitting in right now. So if you have trouble with your knees or your back, you can sit on the edge of that, that raised bed on that lumber or whatever you're using. It's at the right height to sit comfortably and you can reach in and do your weeding or your planting. And it doesn't put a strain on your back and you're not bending over and you're not killing your knees. Um, so that, that's, that's what I do. If you leave them three to four feet wide, you don't walk in them, you can reach in there and do your weeding. And if you don't walk into it, the soil stays nice and loose. I have raised beds uh, in my garden that I turned over last year and I can take my hand right now and stick it right in there because the soil is so loose. So when I plant, all I do is I take my seedling, I dig my hand in there, pull the dirt back, put the seedling in and push it back. Don't need a little shovel or a trowel or anything, the soil is that loose. And it's wonderful because the soil is so loose that the, the, the roots just take off and the um, uh, plants thrive. The downside, as it says here, is they dry out quicker when the weather is hot than the ground does. You will need to water them a little more often. And they require a lot more amended soil. The way around amended soil or getting enough amended soil is to build your raised beds in the fall. If you, raise, if you take them, put the, the frame together in the fall, you can pack it with leaves that you, use, you rake up off your lawn. Pack those leaves down as hard as you can and put maybe an inch or two of soil on top and you can plant in the fall in that inch or two of soil. And then by the, by, by the spring, the uh, microbes and the earthworms will have churned up all of that, uh, those leaves into some beautiful uh, topsoil and you can move that out put some more leaves in or what if your compo have additional compost and put it back and in two years you'll have 16 inches of beautiful topsoil at basically no cost to you and instead of having to pack all those leaves in those bags and put them out on the street you make you make soil out of them. We had some questions earlier about container gardening on a patio and I thought I would talk to the talk about that now because it's basically a small raised bed. If you want to do uh, patio gardening. Your considerations are get the biggest pots you can handle easily. Um, get as much soil around those roots as you can because it keeps the temperature fluctuations down. It holds more water, so you have to water a lot less. Um, try to get good soil, you know, topsoil. Don't use potting soil because it, it won't hold the water uh, as well. And there are many different varieties of vegetables that are specifically been grown to be uh, raised in containers. There are bush type of squash, there are bush peppers, there are bush tomatoes that don't sprawl. There are low height uh, climbing vines for peas and beans. Um, there are even watermelons, believe it or not, that are small, that bush up that you can raise in the, that you can grow in a container. So I can't tell all you all what all of them are, go on any website of a good reputable seed company and you will have a section there for seeds that will do well in a container uh, because they are designed, engineered to uh, stay bushy and not, not spread too long or too wide. One of the, well, let me back up one second. I always ask my classes, those beds that you see there are basically four feet by eight feet. And that's just mainly because cheap, the cheapest lumber comes in eight foot lengths. If you had one four foot by eight foot bed and you gardened it 12 months of the year, I want you to think about how much in terms of dollar value of vegetables you think you, you would get out of that one bed. If you did it 12 months of the year and you did it, you know, succession planting, so it was always planted well. And come up with your number and you'll, 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 I'm sure they're all over the map because I have seen them all over the map when I've taught this class in person. The number is minimum of $600. 
It could be 600, could be 800, depending on where you live and depending on the price of your, your, vegetable, your vegetables in your store. So 600 bucks out of a four foot by eight foot bed. And that's pretty close to giving yourself an $800 raise every year if you do one bed. If you do two beds, it's like a $1,500. So there's a very good reason to do small scale vegetable gardening and start early. One of the keys in planting small vegetable gardens is using seasonal and succession planting. All this says is when one crop is over with, you plant another one in the same spot, very close behind it. And in doing that in, the, in Georgia, you can get 12 months gardening and you can probably get four different crops. Here is one example where in first of February, they put in lettuce, followed by beans, first of May, broccoli in the first of August. And uh, if, if you add up all those days, basically you started in February and I think you're done at the end of September. And at the end of September, you can put lettuce back in or another cold weather crop. So it doesn't take a lot of space. All it takes is a little bit of planning. At the, at the end of your material here, you will see this, um, vegetable planting chart. This is done for the Atlanta metro area or North Georgia. You can get something like that from an extension service in your area. It'll show you when you can put in different plants, uh, how long they take to grow, and then you can build your own succession chart as for your, for your area so you can be planting all through your planting season. In Atlanta, I just, I just did this really very quickly. <clears throat> New Year's Day, 1st of uh, January, you can put out onions. On the 15th of January, you can put out cabbage, carrots, lettuce, mustard, English peas, potatoes, radishes, spinach, and turnips. 1st of February, you can put out beets, broccoli, collards, and kale. 1st of March, bush beans, whole beans, cantaloupe, cauliflower, corn. And then in April, cucumbers, eggplants, okra, peppers, southern peas, sweet potatoes, squash, and tomatoes. So literally you can start gardening in the Atlanta metro area New Year's Day. Here's another example of succession planning, February 15th, June 1st, August 25th. Again, you're using the entire growing season in Metro Atlanta here. And by the time your spinach comes out, you can put in another crop over the winter for a cool weather crop. Uh, you probably put in a, a, a bed of lettuce or something that will that'll take the cool, cool weather. Okay. I can't stress enough, start small because too many gardens don't ever continue because people go out and they break their backs planting huge gardens and they say, oh, this is too much work, I can't do this. If you start small, especially if you do raised beds, plant one. If you like it, plant another one. If you continue that, you can put as many raised beds as you have area that it has sun, or you can get to a, a garden like the picture here where you're actually working in the soil, you're tilling up the ground and you are uh, making that garden as big as you want. You know, my dad during World War II did five acres by himself, but he was motivated because he wanted to contribute to the war effort. Uh, five acres by yourself is pretty brutal and he did it without machinery. So. I would suggest that for anybody. Uh, biggest thing is water. You gotta be close to water. Uh, don't run 500 feet of hose, you will, you will regret it. Start small, be close to your water uh, and you will do very, uh, you'll continue with it, which is I think the goal we all have. You wanna make all your rows east to west because that way the sun shows on them the whole, whole uh, day and anything tall goes at the north part of your garden so it does not shade the plants below it. If you put it on the south side, you're gonna be throwing the shade back onto your lower uh, vegetables that would, would be behind. Here um, are two raised beds. One of the things that you can see in the lower left picture is that there are some trellises in the back made out of string. Uh, those are for climbing vegetables, so they have been planted so they have support so they will go up vertically and, and keep the 
space on the ground for other uh, plants. Uh, you have a couple of rows in there, it looks like beans, a couple of tomatoes, some rows of radishes or carrots. Um, but you have a lot growing there because you've taken the stuff that will sprawl and you've, you've made it go up. On the right hand side of your screen is a uh, mini warehouse that I build here because I, I like to get good yields early in the spring or early in the winter uh, for my food bank. You can see there's several, there's kale in there, there's lettuce, there's bok choy, um, maybe one or two other things which I can't see. But if you can see the center uh, lumber support there, there are metal wires that are bent over that metal support and that come down to the sides of the, the raised bed, the wood. What I do with this is I take a 10 by, 10 by 12 painter's drop cloth or three mils, which probably cost two bucks. I drape it over there and it goes down to the ground. I take the lumber you see on the left-hand side. I put that lumber over the plastic to weigh it down. And then the, on both sides, in the front and the back, what I do is I take these little gem clips that you use for your office and I, I just take the, the plastic and I join it. So basically it is a greenhouse. Um, it's not airtight, uh, but it does give you a lot of growing. Uh, it extends your growing season quite a bit and stuff grows faster and it keeps the frost off if you have frost. So very easy way to make a little mini greenhouse and uh, for $10 or so, you can, uh, you can do the same thing. Okay, one, one point I should make, corn is something that is problematic in a very small garden. You need several rows. So if you're going to plant corn, plant it in a, in a block, a square. Don't make one long row out of it because corn has to pollinate from one pollen from one plant going to the other plant. And it's wind driven. So the best way to get that is to have it very dense, which is to plant it in a, in a square. A big long line may not get pollinated because if the wind blows not exactly down the row, you're not pollinating. Uh, but corn is better if you have a lot more space. Uh, fertilizer, there are some things that we, you'll see later in this presentation that um, need more fertilizer. And if you put those together, it makes your fertilizing a little bit easier to do. Crop rotation, this slide is in here simply to show that if you plant the same thing in the same place, place all the time, you're going to start getting problems with it <clears throat> because a lot of pests and or viruses or, or soil born. And if it's a pest that can move and you plant the crop in the same place every time, you're basically telling the pest where to find it. So if you move it around, it slows down your pest problems and it probably even reduces them. These different families are essentially the same to all of the pests that you uh, may have in your garden. So by moving them around, um, you are minimizing the possibilities. Now in a very small garden, like a raised bed, uh, you can't move things around too much. If you're having real problems, what I would do is I would dig out all the soil, spread it over your lawn or wherever else you need good soil and start over, you know, just uh, either use compost or do what I had suggested about putting more, um, building more soil by using the leaves and you know, your organic matter. In a big garden <clears throat> where you might be 20 by 50 feet, yes, this becomes very really important. Okay. Transplants <clears throat> versus seeds. Most seeds are very easy to start. Um, what I do is I have, and I hope you can see this well, this is a disposable cake tin that you can get at the grocery store. They're about 75 cents or a dollar a piece. It makes the greatest little mini greenhouse that you ever have seen for starting plants. <clears throat> what you do is you take this and you punch some holes in the bottom. You can see there's a lot of holes in the air, so you have drainage. Fill it up with potting soil. Plant your seeds based on the instructions that are on the seed packet. <clears throat> and then you take this 
and you put it in a tray of water and let the water come from bottom up. So it waters the whole thing without disturbing the seeds. Let it drain, put the top on it. So you have your little mini, green, mini greenhouse and put it in a nice bright area of that's warm in your house. Direct sun is not a good idea because with the cover on, you'll cook the seeds. So if, it, if you have to put it in direct sun, put a, put a piece of tissue paper over it or some toilet tissue and just have that sun filtered a little bit. As soon as the seeds sprout, you can take the top off. And then when they get big enough, you know, three or four inches, you can start digging them out and putting them in your garden. What you want to do first, though, is take it outside in a sheltered place for a couple of days and let, let the seedlings get used to cooler temperatures. They call that hardening off. Um, but this one little tin, you could probably start 100 seeds in there. So two or three of these would give you everything that you need. Um, I right now have um, 500 zinnia seeds in, in four of these things. Uh, hopefully they're all going to come up. They have, they have in the past. If you don't want to do seeds, <clears throat> you can get transplants. You can go down to a garden center or one of the big box stores like Lowe's or Home Depot. They all have garden sections. And you can buy your transplants that are you know, four inches tall. What I would recommend is look at <clears throat> the um, transplants that you're going to get. Don't take anything that has any kind of black spots on it or, or places where the leaf is not totally green. Don't take anything where the edges have been eaten by something. <clears throat> you don't want to import bugs into your garden. Uh, but if they're healthy, full plants, um, you know, and, and you're, if you're starting small, you might only need two or three six packs of those plants to get you going. Uh, peppers, tomatoes, eggplants, they do very well. Um, the other stuff that, that, that does better for, from seed, that's actually better to plant the seed itself, Beets, lettuce, peas, spinach, beans, corn. Uh, again, those are pretty big seeds. They're pretty easy to plant outside. Um, and this will get you well on your way to uh, moving your garden along. Okay, I think we're going to take a pause here and we're going to get some questions. <clears throat> so hopefully we have a few and we'll see what, what comes up. I, I think a few is, is an understatement. We've got tons of questions coming in. Um, a lot of them, a lot of them around um, soil prep. Um, okay. So, what suggestions can you give um, for soil prep uh, prior to the spring season um, and growing a vegetable, um, specifically around um, pest prevention, drainage, and and should we be planting cover crops? Okay. <clears throat> um, Soil preparation is, you probably can't have too much. So it's a question of how much work do you wanna do? If you are taking a area that's never been a garden before uh, and you have hard packed soil, uh, you wanna probably spend the money one time to get a tiller and work that soil real hard and you know fluff it up, break it up substantially. But at the same time, you have to put a lot of organic matter into that, that um, soil. So if you have compost, you can use compost, even if it's not totally broken down. You can use peat moss. You can use leaves. Uh, you can use stuff you get uh, at the, at the um, uh, nursery, like black cow or various soil conditioners like peanut shells. There's a whole bunch of things that you can use. But the, the key is if you can break the soil up and get a lot of organic matter into it, even if you have to rent that tiller uh, for a half a day for 50 bucks, uh, I don't know what they cost. I haven't rented one in a long time, but uh, it's well worth it because that'll get your soil well on its way to getting that nice, loose, friable soil that holds a lot of water, has a lot of air for the roots and uh, contains enough organic matter that the, um, the microorganisms are going to be uh, thriving and giving the, so the uh, plants what they need in terms of minerals. So the more, the more you can loosen up the soil, the more you, that you can put in you know, organic matter, the better it's going to be. Drainage is something that if you have an area that is wet, you're going to have to go up. You're going to have to have raised beds. But the only other option is to 
dig trenches, put in drainage tiles, either that black plastic pipe or <clears throat> terracotta tiles, but you have to move the water away. If there's no place to, for the water to go, then you have to go up. You have to make your own drainage by getting you know, raised beds. Um, yeah, I, I, think that, I think that covers what you, you had was mentioned yeah. to me. All right. Um, so the next question is around seedlings and how to prevent um, mold and, and, and the seedlings as they grow in the, in the peat. Okay. If, if you're outside and you put seedlings into the ground, the only problems you should have, well, the only problems you're likely to have is either damping off, which is when the, the uh, mildew just attacks the base of the plant and it flops over. Um, you, can, you can correct that basically by giving your plants a lot of room. They need good, good airflow, the good ventilation. And so if you plant them too tight, too close together, they don't have the airflow, <clears throat> and then you get mold and mildew problems. If, if you plant according to the instructions on the package that says you know, plant them four or five inches apart and then thin to 12 inches, well, if you already have the seedlings, start them at whatever the, is said, you know, in my example, 12 inches. That gives them enough airflow that you shouldn't have problems with mold and mildew. What a lot of people do is they plant a garden so it looks real cute because it's real tight. And all of a sudden you have 10 tomato plants where you should have two. And they all grow together and then they get mold and mildew and uh, sometimes they get viruses. And then the only alternative you have is to rip it all out and start over again. So think about this, the mature size of your plant when you plant. And if you plant them that spacing, you shouldn't have any problems. One of the things that you started off with was soil testing. Can you tell us how do we get our soil tested? Okay, <clears throat> well, it's a good time to do that now. Uh, the Cooperative Extension Service in every state um, has local offices that will take uh, soil to be tested. And what, what you do is in the area that you're gonna be growing your vegetables, you scrape away the top four or five inches of soil and then dig down in maybe 10 spots in your area and get the soil where the roots will grow, which is maybe three to six inches below the ground. Take, a, take like a half a, a cup out of each of those 10 sites, mix it up in a clean plastic bucket. And then the, the Cooperative Extension Office has very these small brown soil bags. They want like a cup and a half of that soil. You put that in, in that bag, you take it to the Extension Office. You have to pay a fee, I think it's $12 in, in Metro Atlanta. And you tell them what you want to grow and they will test your soil and say, okay, if you want to grow carrots, you need to do this. If you want to grow flowers, you need to do that. If you want to just have a general vegetable garden, you need, you need to do this. And what they will do is give you specific instructions on what needs to be added to your soil, either to change the pH or to increase the amount of nutrients that are in it for the, what you need to grow. And that's, that's, it's as simple as that. Okay. A um, couple of questions around the best, the best materials to use for a raised bed. Um, specifically is treated lumber, is, is that okay? Is it safe for the environment? Is it safe for your plants? I get that question a lot. <clears throat> yeah. Treated lumber is treated by pressure forcing chemicals into the wood. Absent that, pressure, chemicals don't come back out. The only way they can be released is if that wood basically falls apart and rots. You're gonna replace it way before that happens. And if you're using pressure treated wood, I have had my, my garden beds up now for nine years and they're still fine. So I wouldn't worry about it. I, I had one of my students in one of my classes who said she worked at the Tifton Labs which is a UTA uh, 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 labs where they do uh, plant research. And she says that the chemicals they use for pressure treating, but the molecules are too large for them to be absorbed into a, into a plant. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what she said. So I have had no problems. I've never seen any weird things growing. Um, uh, so, I, I think it's a non-issue, but if you want to go and use cedar, it's five times more expensive, but 
it lasts and it's fine. I think we only have time for one more question. We can take more questions at the end. Is there one more we can do now? Gotcha. So several questions around um, horse manure. Should we be using it in a comp, uh, compost bin? Is it okay to use in your garden? How long to let it cure? Things like that. Okay. Horse manure, uh, cow manure, chicken manure are great sources of natural nitrogen. You do not want to put them onto your garden right away. Uh, horse manure and cow manure have a lot of weed seeds that are not killed by going through the animal. So if you put them in your garden, you'll have a weed extravaganza. Uh, chicken manure in, in its fresh state, there's lots of nitrogen that can burn your plants very easily. So I would compost all three of those things. Um, they, they're really good for taking all your leaves and your, your fall stuff and mixing it with them. All the nitrogen really kicks it off and rots that compost very quickly. And then the next spring you can use it and most of the weed seeds will be killed by the heat and uh, it makes great soil. So yes, use it if, you, if it's available, you can get it for free, definitely use it. But you should compost it first. Okay, we're gonna take more questions at the end. We're gonna, we're gonna run through here the rest of the presentation. Easiest plants for beginners. I'm not, I'm not gonna read this, it's pretty evident. <clears throat> uh, all, all I can say is if you are beginning a garden and your soil is not fantastic soil, use the stuff that can get away with you know, being in so-so soil. As your soil gets amended, it gets richer, fuller, more looser. Um, you can see all these other things that you can watch or that you can grow rather. And, you probably will have everything inside of two years that you want in the garden because your soil at the end of two years will be fine. There's a mention here about watching for pests, cucumbers, melons, eggplant, pumpkins. Uh, if you want to grow those, fine. I, the key there is to look at them regularly. If you start to see your, the leaves being eaten or you turn the leaf over and there's bugs on the underside of the leaf, which is where they like to be because that's where it's cool and moist. Um, then you'll have to do something about those. But again, if you space your, your plants out so they have good airflow, you shouldn't have too many problems with those. Okay. This is uh, seasonal planting that we talked about earlier. You can see that if you, if you time your, your planting, you can go 12 months of the year if you have a 12 month growing season. You can plant stuff in January, February, March, all the way through the summer, uh, then again in the fall, even even late winter, late fall and in October, which are onions. Uh, and that um, list that I showed you earlier, uh, this has all of those things in it. Um, you can uh, you know, look at this and you can plant and make your own planting guide accordingly to where you are in Georgia or Belgium. And if you do a small garden, it's very easy as something comes out to plant one or two seeds in that little spot. Um, you don't need to plant a whole row. Uh, what you wanna do is find out how much you're gonna use and plant only that amount. I should mention this is probably a good time to do it. You don't need to plant all the seeds that are in a seed package. If you only need you know, a two foot or three foot row of, of um, radishes, you don't need to plant the whole package. If you take the extra seeds, Put them in a glass jar, leave them, leave them in, the, in the papers the, that they came in, the little package, roll it tight, get a glass jar, put about an inch of, of white rice in it, uncooked white rice, because that absorbs moisture. Put the seed packages in, in the jar, screw it tight, put it in your refrigerator, <clears throat> it'll last three years. So there's no, there's no need to worry about planting everything because you'll just have a garden that's going crazy. And you probably don't want a 50 foot row of radishes if you only have three people or four people. Okay, wonderful, cool weather plant, lettuce, spinach. Uh, you can put that stuff in now. It'll, it'll bloom before the weather gets hot. <clears throat> I mean, bloom. It'll, it'll germinate and you, know, you can harvest it before the weather gets hot. Then you can turn around and plant it again in the fall. Um, and it, uh, it just loves cool weather and it grows wonderfully in Metro Atlanta and North Georgia. Okay. Again, all these leafy vegetables, they love the cold. Collards, kale, turnips, mustard, uh, 
Collards love a little bit of frost. They get a lot more sugar that way, so they taste really good. Uh, for all of you who do not know it, the tops of beets, the beet greens, are the most nutritious green you can eat. I found that out last year. Uh, but all these other things are excellent. Turnips have great greens. There's new varieties of turnips out now that are about the size of a small apple, and you can eat them raw because they're sweet and they're not gritty and, and tough like you know the big turnips you may have you know, had before that are maybe the size of a softball. These are maybe a little bit bigger than a, a golf ball, but they're delicious. Um, so <clears throat> the winter and, and the cool weather are great for these greens and they're easy to plant. Uh, you put them in and they come up and you keep them weeded and you keep them, um, keep the ground covered with um, mulch and they do very, very well. Beets, we talked about, beet greens are very good for you. Again, you put them in spring or fall um, and they don't really need uh, a lot of TLC. Uh, they come up and you just keep them watered and you keep a little bit of mulch around them to keep the weeds down and they come pretty much two months, you've got a good crop and then pull those out, put out, put out, put in something else. Broccoli, uh, you need really good soil for broccoli. <clears throat> you gotta have a lot of organic matter in it. It's gotta be well drained. Uh, this is probably, if you're in a new spot, it's probably a second or third year crop for you. But if you wanna buy a little six pack of them at the garden store and put them in, no harm, you know, trying. They do get cabbage worms, um, and you can see cabbage worms or caterpillars about the size of your pinky, uh, and they, they move along on top of the leaves and eat big holes in the leaves. Uh, you can literally pick them off and put them in a, a bucket of soapy water, and you know that's all you need to do. Or if you have chickens, chickens will love you forever if you give them cabbage worms because it's a nice, tasty treat for them. Uh, you can use row covers. This is a row cover is a non-woven, very, very light scrim of um, fiber. It keeps the moths away from the cabbage and the broccoli and the moths are what lay the eggs that create the caterpillars. Um, you can get row covers fairly inexpensively through a lot of the, the gardening magazines or the seed catalogs um, and they're very easy to use. Okay, beans. Again, very easy crop. You got to you have to plant them so they run up on something. If you have runners, there are bush types that are uh, grow maybe slightly above knee high, um, and it's just personal preference. You can pretty much support them any way you want. You can use string. You can use bamboo. A lot of people use concrete reinforcing mat. Uh, you can use tomato cages. Uh, basically, you just need to be able to get up to about six feet, and they will climb and Make up very little space. Okay, southern peas, you know, these are the well, brown eyed, um, the black eyed peas and things like that. Um, again, they go up. Uh, you can uh, trellis those, or I think there are also bush types. You want to make sure you put them in after the frost, which is tax day down here, April 15th. But when you pay your taxes, you can plant the warm weather stuff in your garden. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Again, very easy crop to grow. Tomatoes, tomatoes, everybody loves them. Um, they're easy to grow if you don't have uh, rabbits and or squirrels that want to eat them before you get to them. If you have those uh, animals, you need to fence them with very, very small uh, fencing, like half inch you know, spaces. If you use chicken wire, the rabbits can get through it. Uh, the baby rabbits anyway, and squirrels can also. So use very small uh, space wire. Uh, best to put them in later rather than sooner because potatoes do not like cold soil. And if you give them cold soil, they will just not grow. Plant them deep because they will get extra, extra roots coming out of the stem that you plant down. Um, they're different kinds, different sizes. The determinants, you get them all at once. The indeterminates, they they ripen over a period of time. So those are probably best if you want to have your garden yield for a long time. Cucumbers and watermelons. Um, these are pretty much seed plants. Um, I mean, you just plant the seeds and they grow. 
Cucumbers, you can train up watermelons, the small ones you can train up, but you have to support the fruit. Um, and um, you can do that with slings. Old pantyhose makes great slings. Also, if you wrap pantyhose around your tomatoes, the, the um, uh, rabbits and the squirrels will leave them alone because they don't like to chew nylon. I found that out last year, a friend of mine told me it works very well. <clears throat> Sweet potatoes, this is a runner. Uh, it needs good sandy soil, it needs a lot of sun and a lot of space. And they will grow out 10, 15 feet if you let them. <clears throat> you can plant them in the hill uh, and you can you know, crop the uh, vines back so they don't run too far. Uh, you just get smaller number of potatoes and or smaller potatoes, but you, know, you, can, you can size them to whatever area that you have. Eggplant uh, is a bush crop. Uh, they all you know, great for uh, containers. They grow maybe three feet high, 18 inches wide, depending on the variety. Um, pretty easy to grow down here. Don't have a lot of pests. Uh, and you can see that they need a lot of sun and they need the warmer weather before you plant them. Same with peppers, uh, need a lot of sun, need the warmer weather. Uh, very easy to grow in Metro Atlanta. Uh, pretty much pest free in my experience uh, in the last 10, 12 years. And uh, <clears throat> they grow, they, they yield very well. Zucchini, squash in general, you have a problem with uh, the squash vine borers. It's, it's a little um, moth that lays a, an egg. And when that egg hatches, it'll dig into the vine where it comes out of the root and it'll suck all the sap. That's what it feeds on. And you, you won't get a lot of vegetables, a lot of squash. <clears throat> so this is something where you can use that row cover that we talked about earlier. You can cover the uh, vines, keep the moths away. And then when the flowers start to open up, you take the cover off so the bees and the moths can pollinate the flowers. And you give them a week or two, and then you put the covers back on and you get a really good crop of, of squash, probably more than you want, but uh, you can give it away to your neighbors. Uh, if for those of you who want to be very adventurous, you can pull the, the uh, blossoms off. And if you've ever had fried squash blossoms, they are a real treat. Uh, you fill them full of these wonderful seasonings and you twist them shut and you uh, dip them in egg batter and you saute them and they're delicious. But you know, it takes a lot of squash blossoms to make a meal. So you have to decide whether or not you want the blossoms or the fruit, you know, the squash itself. But I've had both of them, both versions. Uh, you can see some of the types here. Uh, there are compact ones uh, that are more bushy than, than runners. And um, they, will, they will do very well as long as you give them enough sun and good soil. Okra is the vegetable that keeps on giving and giving and giving and giving and giving. Okra, Takes very little work, but you have to harvest it on a regular basis. If you don't harvest it every four or five days, you will get pods that are 10 inches long and it's like chewing bamboo. <clears throat> so you want the pods that are, oh, four or five inches long, the smaller ones. So you have to pick them when they're young. And when you do that, the, the, the plant keeps blooming and you get those from probably over a two month period. So they, they are very, very prolific in their yield. And if you like fried okra, that's delicious. I eat it raw, I eat it right off the plant because to me, it tastes like celery, it's delicious. Um, sandy soil, we mentioned a lot of organic matter and the rest of that pretty self-explanatory. I have never grown herbs. <clears throat> um, you can see the kinds here that you can put in. They're, they're warm weather plants, so this is late spring to put them out. Um, a lot of people just put a couple um, small pots right outside their door of their kitchen, and that's fine. If you want to uh, grow these in large quantities, then obviously you've got to get them in the garden so they have enough <clears throat> nutrition from, from the soil. Uh, well, I should also mention uh, garlic pretty much grows like onions, and if you love fresh garlic, um, very easy to grow in Metro Atlanta. Um, and uh, it tastes totally different than the stuff you buy in the store. Totally different. Okay. Mulching and watering. This, uh, 
something I want to touch on, which is very important. Mulch does a lot of things. <clears throat> and what we're talking about here is ground up leaves, uh, the uh, grass you pick up off your lawn, uh, compost that's not fully composted, Wh whatever you have that's organic. Uh, I prefer organic rather than plastic or, or the synthetics. Mulch does a lot of things. It feeds the soil. It keeps the soil temperature more stable because plants do not like it when it gets too hot or too cold on their roots. Uh, they just stop growing. Um, it conserves water. <clears throat> and if you use paper mulch, it also reflects sunlight up onto your plants so your plants grow fast. Uh, if you have a shredder at home, and you shred all of your documents. Shredded white paper makes great mulch. Uh, it'll it'll mat down to be, uh, maybe like a start with about four inches and match down to like a one inch sponge, and it stays put. And the water goes through it, and it reflects sunlight. And it's a really good way to make sure that only the plants know all your financial information. Watering <clears throat> in Metro Atlanta, one inch a week. Use a watering wand. Water the soil where the roots are. Don't water the leaves. If you water the leaves, you start getting mildew problems, especially when the water gets hot. Um, you can see here the different kinds of mulch, dry grass, pine straw, compost. Sheets of newspaper are very good because it, they do uh, rot out over a year or so. Uh, water early or late at night. Water deeply. Uh, if you have an automatic sprinkler, the way to know that you're getting an inch of water is take a tuna fish can put it out in your garden in three or four places. And when that tuna fish can is full, you've got an inch of water. <clears throat> then you can time your sprinklers. But definitely mulch, it's well worth it because it builds your soil and it makes your plants grow a lot better. Okay. We had some questions about fertilizer using conventional fertilizer, chemical versus organic. What, I'd, what I'll say is, is organic fertilizer like compost, uh, is weak fertilizer. If you take compost, it's like 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium percentages. But chemical fertilizers, as you can see in some of those numbers, are, are much stronger, much, uh, much more potent. If you want to use chemical fertilizer, you don't need a lot on a raised bed, four by eight, a handful will do it once or twice a year. If you're feeding your soil regularly with organic matter, with compost, or making your soil, you probably have enough where you don't need to use organic, I mean, or non organic fertilizer. But what I always do is I just fertilize once a year. I go buy a half a bag of fertilizer at a garage sale for three bucks, and I just take a handful and just throw it once a year on my beds, and it seems to work fine. Uh, depending on what, you, what you're growing, you might need a little bit more. If you want to get heavier, you can get into fish emulsions, you can get into uh, rotted compost like black cow and some of the other things you can buy at a box store or nursery. <clears throat> but there's enough online where you can decide how much work you want to want to do. Uh, a 20 pound, excuse me, a 20 pound bag of fertilizer is the equivalent of about 300 pounds of cow manure. So you decide how much weight you want to move around. Um, the cow manure is obviously much better for your soil because it builds it. The fertilizer is much better for your back because you don't break it. Okay. We've talked a lot about organic and decomposed or organic matter in terms of, of uh, compost. Cow manure, fish, kelp. Uh, if you have availability of seaweed, seaweed is very good fertilizer. It has a lot of micronutrients in it. You have to rinse it off first, get the salt off of it. But anything up in this first area, if you get it, it's great for your soil, it builds the soil. Uh, organic is good for your plants, but doesn't really do anything to build your soil. One of the things that a soil test will tell you is what you need to do in terms of fertilizer to make your soil better for the crops that you want to grow. Here is follow feedings. Um, this is pretty much self explanatory Planetary. As soon as stuff comes up, give it a light application every three or four weeks if you're using chemicals. Uh, you can put organic fertilizer on your, your, your plants anytime because it's, it's, it's not as strong as the other stuff. 
Okay, companion planting, this is three or four crops at the same time that all are in a symbiotic relationship. They help each other. You know, in Georgia, you have the three sisters, which is what the Cherokee Indians used to grow, corn, beans, and squash. The corn provides the upright trellis for the squash and the beans to grow up. The beans fix nitrogen in the soil, which helps the corn grow. <clears throat> the squash um, just grew, I guess. I don't know if that was symbiotic. But all of these helped each other. They could grow, all grow in the same place, and it was very good use of this of the space. Um, there are a lot of other ones. Uh, flowers, for example, zinnias and marigolds help keep um, uh, pests out of your garden. Zinnias attract a lot of bees and birds, and they uh, also attract butterflies and moss, which the bees and birds will feed on. And if you have birds in your gardens, you have a lot less pests, you have a lot less beetles. So if you plant flowers, this is part of sustainability. If you put a water feature in your garden, a small uh, a bird bath, that brings birds in, the birds eat the bugs, they're attracted by the flowers. And it's very, good to have all of those things working in conjunction because then you have harmony in nature and you don't get anything way out of wax or you don't get a lot of bugs and a lot of pests. Okay, um, a little bit over, but I'm not too bad. Okay, we have these resources. Um, if you're in Georgia, well, actually anywhere, if you go on the UGA website and dash publications, there are about 5,000 different publications there. Uh, most of them have to do with agriculture in the state of Georgia, but they are all useful no matter where you are. You will probably also have a similar website for the cooperative extension area in your, your state or your city it has publications that are more specifically targeted to your, your geographic location. If you live in the South um, and you only wanna buy one book, the Southern Living Garden Book is an excellent all around publication. That's the only one that I have. Um, it's very good. If you're in Metro Atlanta, if you have questions, you can see the extension helpline is there. Uh, we're happy to answer your questions. If we don't know, we'll say we don't know, but we will find out the answer and we will call you back. So all of those things are excellent resources for you and they are um, available easily. Okay. I'm gonna move over now. So we've been getting a lot of questions on availability of this uh, video. Um, shortly, we'll be sending out a follow-up uh, email that will contain the links um, to our YouTube and Facebook channels where this uh, video will be uh, posted so you can review it as many times as you like. It will leave, live there for quite some time. I'm sure George will stick around and take some more questions. Okay. Um, so there's there's some questions around um, how do you keep pests away? Deer, squirrels, rabbits, things that dig in your garden, eat your leaves, things like that. What's the best pest management? If you're talking about four-footed creatures, fencing is the only way to keep them out. Um, <clears throat> for the smaller ones, you can use something called hardware cloth, which is half inch wire mesh, it's galvanized, so it lasts a long time and it'll keep out everything that is small like rabbits, squirrels. Um, if you're talking about deer, deer can jump an eight foot fence. So if you have a deer problem, you need a 10 foot fence around your, your property or your garden area. They do make deer netting, which is um, 10 foot high. I think it's one inch space nylon uh, mesh that you put, put basically put up on poles and that'll keep the deer out of your garden because they will not, uh, they can't jump that high. Um, you can also put out um, nylon fishing line around the perimeter of your garden, two or three layers high, separated by two or three feet. Uh, deer hit nylon fishing line, they don't know what it is and they don't go any further. Um, they won't even try to jump it. Uh, it's a good idea to put a couple of orange streamers every every so often, so you remind, it reminds you that that's there, so you don't run into it. But uh, nylon fishing line works also very well. 
Um, if you have things like blueberries or tomatoes and you have bird problems and you have to basically en enclose it totally uh, by putting <clears throat> um, netting over the top of it as well. Uh, blueberries especially, the birds are very, very clever at getting underneath what, uh, netting if it's not stapled to the ground or flying in from the top. So you have to put netting over the top of blueberries. So basically it's, it's exclusion by, by mechanical means, which is netting and, and fencing. If you have pests like uh, <clears throat> beetles and uh, cabbage loopers, worms, a lot of that is uh, proper spacing. So you don't have a lot of humidity. Uh, you can use uh, insecticidal soaps, uh, and spray them, the soap causes the bug to drop off because it can't breathe and once it drops off, it doesn't come back again. Uh, there, there, are very, there are several things that are non-organic chemicals that you can use. Insecticidal soaps, you can use plain old dishwashing liquid and spray it on. Um, you can use um, different, uh, or, uh, or different this bacteria, there's Bacillus thuringiensis, which you mix up in water and you spray it and the, the, the beetles and the cabbage uh, loopers ingest it and destroys their digestive system and they die. It's totally harmless to human beings. <clears throat> you can get all this, more of this online uh, if you want to just Google it. Any other questions? Um, um, <laughs> you talked about mulch. Yeah. Is that the best way to control weeds and about how much mulch should be used? Is there a a depth that you want to put down? Yes, mulch is extremely good for controlling weeds. <clears throat> if you haven't done anything with your soil, what I'd recommend is put down a couple layers of newspaper, you know, wet it so it, it stays down, uh, cut it to fit between your rows or fold it so it fits between your rows. And then over that newspaper, put a inch or two of dried grass or leaves, crumbled up, you know, shredded leaves. And by the time the newspaper rots, all of the leaves that are trying to come up through it will have died because they haven't been able to get sunlight. Very simple, very effective way to do it. Right. And then put two or three inches of um, mulch on your garden every year and keep it at two or three inches and you should have no weeds at all. Okay, great. Um, just one more, uh, in terms of pruning, pruning tomatoes, what's the best way? Should, should we prune the, the leaves that are at the bottom of the plant or is, is there a better way to keep them pruned and healthy? Okay, <clears throat> tomatoes get um, what I call suckers. If you look at it, the, the main stem of, the, of the, um, the tomato, you'll have a side branch going off and then right in the middle, right here, you get these little suckers. Just pinch those off and keep the, the main stem going up and the leaf and the, the side stems that'll have the, the flowers that'll bear the fruit. All those suckers, you can take all those right out. If the plant's getting too tall for your support, you can actually cut the top, uh, but you can you know size your, your, your plant cultivar to the height of, of the uh, trellises that you have and most, Garden, garden um, seed catalogs will tell you the height of the tomatoes. So you can, you can kind of size it to that. But definitely take out all the suckers because that just wastes the energy of the plant uh, and doesn't produce any fruit. Got it. So, so for the folks that are still on, we talked a lot about pest management and bringing in things that are um, helpful for your plants. There is a, a Zoom webinar on Sunday, March the 21st at 2 p.m and it's called Attracting Wildlife and Detracting Critters. So that would be a really good one for you to watch if you're having a lot of issues. Yes, very good. <clears throat> yeah, attracting birds to your garden uh, is an excellent thing because most birds need to eat their weight in insects every day or every other day. So if you bring birds close by your garden by putting out flowers or putting out, uh, the flowers attract the, the moths and the caterpillars, and, the butterflies, which the birds will eat. <clears throat> and if you attract them by putting out um, a bird bath where they have water, uh, your pest load will go way, way down. Excellent. Okay. 
I believe that hits most of the plan of the questions. Um, let's see. Let me. Let, here's here's a good one. Um, if my plants have lots of leaves, maybe some flowers, but I don't get any kind of fruit, what am I doing wrong, or what could be wrong? <clears throat> A um, <clears throat> couple of things to look at. Um, you may be using too much fertilizer. Uh, if you have a lot of nitrogen, it promotes leaf growth, but not fruit set. Uh, so you might want to have your, your plant or your soil tested. <clears throat> you might not have enough sun. If the plant may not be getting enough energy to actually set fruit or like tomatoes or peppers. Uh, so it's probably enough sun to make the leaves grow, but not enough sun to, uh, to get the, the, the produce that you want. So take a look at how much sun you get. If you're not getting eight hours, you're probably not gonna get things like tomatoes and eggplant and peppers uh, and things like that to, to, to grow well and set a lot of, a lot of, a lot of vegetables. Uh, beyond excess nitrogen and not enough strong sun, uh, I'd, I'd be guessing. Those are two things I'd look at first. Okay. I think that hits pretty much most of the questions. Great. Well, I hope you all enjoyed it. It's fun to teach it. Thank you. joining and uh, please join us for our other classes uh, growing lavender on this Sunday uh, coming up Sunday at two o'clock um, I think you'll really enjoy that one as well as right tree right place which is the following Wednesday um, so please join us for more of our classes and I hope you all have a good evening